wasn't found in most of the traditional community-based, uh, medical model-based services in the community. So a lot of them stopped coming. And of course, true to the mental health system, uh, rather than take a look at uh, how our consumers felt about our services, we pathologized their behavior and called it treatment resistance <laughs> and became determined to figure out why these individuals do not take their meds, do not participate in the programs we're offering, rather than look at the kind of programs we were offering and trying to fashion a different experience. That's sort of the philosophy behind our agency now. We've grown from one halfway house in 69 to uh, uh, 14 programs in San Francisco, three programs, two of them uh, crisis residential treatment in Santa Rosa, Sonoma County, and an array of programs, including a crisis program in Napa County, with no particular intention to grow. Uh, <laughs> San Francisco is much too interesting a place to keep working to worry about extrapolating what we do to a bunch of other counties. It's never uh, less than a challenge. So our first crisis residential program, La Posada, was opened in 1978 in the Mission District of San Francisco. Um, and La Posada's uh, in their, uh, goal was, at that time, it was, as far as I could tell from reading, the first truly acute residential treatment program opened in the country on a social model, community integrated basis. Uh, the only way, and it remains true to this day, the only way into our four, they're called by our county in San Francisco, acute diversion programs, uh, is through the emergency room at San Francisco General Hospital. Uh, and that's the way we designed La Posada from the beginning because I was aware of the fact that there are a lot of crisis services um, that aren't really that acute. Uh, they're needed. You know, there's an array of crisis programs, and you're seeing it in your survey. And my differentiation of the taxonomy of crisis residential is there's respite programs, and then there's a kind of uh, uh, situational crisis residential programs, and then there's what we try to specialize in, which is acute diversion. They're all called crisis residential, but they have different target populations often. And depending on the exigencies of a particular community, they all serve a real purpose in diverting certain people from more uh, restrictive settings. Uh, if there's nothing else available to a mental health system, when a client is in crisis, however acute it is, at midnight on a, fri on a Friday night, except a hospital bed, then we use the hospital bed. Um, if ever, as the cliche would have it, if, if uh, all we have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And we're, we were dedicated to the idea that a vast majority of the people, even in a highly stressed emergency room of public care, in San Francisco, a large majority of those individuals do not need to be involuntarily hospitalized. So um, that's what La Posada started at. And we decided, you know, the goal here is to divert whenever possible from hospitalization. Hospitalization is becoming a rare resource. It's very expensive. And increasingly, under the kind of utilization review and medical necessity uh, requirements of Medicaid and others, not much can get done in the 10, 8, 10 day, two week maximum most communities have for inpatient hospitalization, uh, for, which from my point of view is a good thing. Uh, the sooner we can get people out of the hospital, the better, and even better is to divert them whenever possible to a different kind of program in the community. Steve, could you tell so, us a little bit about how you developed the relationship with the hospital and maybe with the, the with law enforcement to really demonstrate your relevance to them and uh, and just ha having your as far as your your intake policies and, and being so open, uh, how that helped you to build your program? Well, basically, you know, because we were trying to prove ourselves back, you know, there was still a lot of the flux in the, uh, uh, the characterization of mental, uh, community mental health programs in 1978. And in a, in a community as progressive as San Francisco, you have a chance to actually be kind of bold. 
So when we went into the discussion with the county, we, we actually uh, funded La Posada through an expansion grant in the original community mental health centers program that was uh, a short-lived uh, 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 effort. Um, and when we developed the program, because there's such skepticism about the fact that you can treat somebody, say, on a involuntary hold in the community without looking at how subjective that line is. It depends often as much on what's available as the actual presentation of the client. I went into the meetings with the hospital, San Francisco General Hospital, the emergency room, and said, we'll take anybody you send us. It was very common for people who work in my field to uh, start with a list of who we won't serve. And I had learned from the eight years we had done transitional residential treatment programs, halfway houses that became increasingly more clinically oriented and taking more risks, that, that there are a whole range of people that the halfway houses used to exclude who we served very well once we admitted them into the program, but it was a barrier to getting in. So I knew that the skepticism that was going to be there from the system saying, well, you, you're not going to take the people we need you to take. So we said, we'll take anyone you send us. And then if it doesn't work out, we'll sit down with you and we'll discuss what, why this referral didn't take. We also had actually, Travis, we had a, uh, a serendipitous opportunity when we opened La Posada that actually is the reason that the county let us do this and, and replicated our model four times in San Francisco, which was the emergency room for that district in the Community Mental Health uh, Centers Act, you were divided up into catchment areas. And that catchment area, the Mission District, the primary Spanish-speaking uh, area of San Francisco, needed a place to put their county emergency staff. And they put them on the first floor of La Posada when we opened it. So there was a ground floor where the police and everybody else would bring people in that district for crisis triage, uh, all on 5150s. And then we were the second and third floor in the same building. So what we had going for us is even if the crisis staff had never seen one of these kinds of programs before, that we were the logistics worked to our advantage. They were in our building doing an assessment, and if they wanted to hospitalize a client, they had to get them five, eight blocks to San Francisco General. So what happened early on is they would send people upstairs to our living room to our staff to see if we could work with them. And that gave us a chance to actually intervene in a variety of crises we never would have seen if they had been brought first to San Francisco General and then the, the, the emergency room staff there were going to have to be committed to diverting them to La Posada. So we had the chance right away to even uh, surprise ourselves about the level of acute crisis that we were able to intervene with with enough staff and enough intentionality and with actually a kind of intentional community intervention as opposed to just a 5150 and then medications and then wait for the crisis to abate and then try to figure out where to send them. So that allowed us to demonstrate not only to the system but to ourselves the range of clients that we could work with and also to differentiate when a referral to an alternative was not going to be successful for the client or in the best interest of the client. So police were one of our earliest referral sources, not to us. They were bringing them into the crisis uh, triage center downstairs. But what they were learning is, because they used to have to hang around waiting for the assessment to see if they were going to have to transport people across to San Francisco General, and they didn't like that. They, you know, as you all know, Police do not like the idea that they're an arm of the mental health system. They would rather we took care of these problems ourselves. But what would happen at La Posada is they'd bring somebody, they'd drive up to the building in their police car with someone in a 5150, they'd drop them off at the triage center, and within 20 minutes we could decide whether that person was going to be admitted to La Posada, and then they got to drive away drop the 5150 hold, the involuntary hold in California, and drive away. So they became early allies of acute diversion because of the way in which it helped them not have to deal with the bureaucracy and the nightmare of taking people to San Francisco General Psychiatric Emergency Room. 
And then over time, our best allies, our best uh, advocates when we're in the system of care are the staff at San Francisco General's emergency room because we work symbiotically. They need us and we need them. And so now what it's been 30, 40 years almost or 40 years since we opened it, uh, the acute diversion programs around the city now all work really closely with psych emergency and the police. Wow. That's incredible, Steve. I mean, I think it, it, for, for people who are interested in opening a crisis home, I think you guys really uh, set the tone the right way as far as your, your relationship development with your uh, fellow community providers, with your potential referral sources. And um, I think even people today who, are, who have been operating a home for a long time, uh, there's opportunities to learn um, from, uh, from your experiences and, and how you've been able to just embed yourself as a, as a stronghold in the, uh, in, in the service continuum. So that's excellent. And Steve, thanks so much for taking some time to, to share information. Um, if, you're, if people on the, the call are interested in learning more about the Progress Foundation, uh, you can check out their website um, and there's some great descriptions of, of the homes as well. So thank you, Steve, for uh, sharing, those, uh, sharing your thoughts with us. You're very welcome. Okay, so um, on to today's topic, uh, which is metrics and outcomes. So we talked about, uh, in, in last month's meeting, we talked about uh, the scope and function of, these, of our crisis services. And today we're gonna be talking about uh, areas such as customer satisfaction, outcome measures, process measures, uh, and the challenges and barriers to collecting metrics, and then also employee satisfaction. Um, so we had about 30 respondents uh, for this uh, for this round, uh, which was which was good for us. It's one of the higher ones that we've had to go off of as far as our data. Um, but before we dive into our results, uh, we are going to turn uh, the conversation over to Margie Belfour, uh, who is the VP for Clinical Innovation and Quality at Connections AZ. Uh, so Margie uh, has some background as a scientist. Uh, and then developed a passion for clinical work in public sector behavioral health. Uh, she did some, uh, it, her, what, what got her excited is when she started to use some of her clinical and research work in the quality area. And uh, she provided a great presentation last year at the National Council Conference um, on metrics uh, for crisis services. Uh, so um, Margie, are you with us? I am. Great. I will do my best to navigate the slides through uh, for you, but we welcome you to the call. Thanks for uh, for joining us. Happy to be here. So thank you for the introduction. And we've really worked hard on developing measure sets for what we do in our crisis services, because as you know, there aren't really any standard measures. Um, there are a lot of measures out there, though. So CMS has hospital compare and you can go and look up your local hospital and see how they are. And the Joint Commission has core measure sets. The ones that are kind of most similar to what we do is there's the hospital-based inpatient psych measures. That's why if anyone here works inpatient, people are always asking you to justify why you have multiple antipsychotics. That comes from there. Um, emergency medicine has core measure sets. Um, health plans have measure sets. They're set too. But there's not any measures for crisis or emergency psychiatric services. And so... If you go to the next slide, it's like, well, why is that? Why is crisis left out? And it sounds like this group has really been talking about this, the fact that there is no standard definition for crisis services. If I say I run a crisis program, then, and I tell that to 10 different people who work in 10 different states, they will interpret that 10 different ways. Um, you know, it sounds like y'all are doing a lot to try to categorize that and come up with a nomenclature for that. Um, and the reason that is, is because, I think, is because crisis services fly under the federal radar because it's left to the states. It's not Medicare doesn't pay for much of what we do, so there's no kind of CMS regs and standards that we all abide by. And you've heard that that saying, if you've seen one state behavioral health system, you've seen one state behavioral health system. I mean, it really can be more granular at the county level. You know, it's, things are just different from where you go. So all of the outcomes that were held to by our various payers are almost completely disjointed. So the next slide, 
um, we'll talk a little bit about what we did to try to develop our own measure set because we kind of had to. So we operate two similar programs, one in Phoenix and one in Tucson. So I'm over quality for our organization, but I run the one in Tucson. And we needed to be able to, once we took on the Tucson facility, we needed to be able to kind of compare and have a common way of reflecting the outcomes of what we do as an organization. You know, and both of them are facility-based crisis programs. And what we do is um, psych urgent care, basically. So we have like a 24-7 kind of walk-in urgent care clinic for med refills and things like that. We have 23-hour observation, and we have a short-term inpatient stay. But we'll be talking mostly about the 23-hour the ops level. And that's um, similar to what Steve was saying. We take everybody. Um, we get about 900 patients a month of highly acute folks coming from the police, um, transfers from ERs, walk-ins. The mission of these programs in Arizona is to try to decrease the incidence of people with behavioral health needs sitting in emergency rooms and sitting in jails and going to inpatient units unnecessarily. Um, but th So they're very similar, these two programs that we have, but there's some differences. So in Tucson, we have kids. In Phoenix, we don't. Um, in Tucson, we're attached to an academic medical center, and in Phoenix, we're not. Um, at the time, we had peers in Tucson, but not in Phoenix, you know, just and just because of weirdnesses in facility requirements, we were doing two identical services in two different cities, and one had an inpatient license and one had an outpatient license because there's no crisis license, you know. So, um, you know, so there's some dif differences, and we also have started to do consultation in other areas, and so we needed to b basically have a standard way to talk about, well, what is quality in, in crisis services? To go to the next slide, we used a quality improvement tool called a critical to quality tree, which is something that the QI folks use to try to translate values into something that is actually discrete measures. And so the way it works is you, you say, well, broadly, what are you trying to accomplish? You know, we want to be excellent in crisis services. And then what are those key attributes that kind of define that value from the perspective of the customer that you're serving? And then from there, you go and define measures that reflect each attribute. So what we did is we sat and came up, well, what are our values? When we say that we want to be excellent in crisis services, like, what does that mean? And, well, we should be timely. This, you got a crisis, you got a crisis, and you don't have time to wait. Um, safety is, above all, you know, the most important thing. We need to be accessible and be there when people need us. Um, we want to do things in the least restrictive way, and we want to be effective and consumer and family centered. And then especially crisis serves such an important part in the community, you have many partners. And so we needed to reflect how well we're partnering with our various stakeholders. So that was kind of the easy part to sit around and talk about what our values are. The harder part is coming up, well, what are some measures that actually reflect that? Um, and so the next slide is kind of a little primer on kind of measure theory. And you guys may have heard this before. There's Don Abedian is kind of the father of measures in healthcare. And his model is he talks about there's structure measures, there's process measures, and outcome measures. So um, structures is kind of what do you have. And this is doesn't have anything really to do with outcomes, but it's like you know, when you're describing your programs, for example, like do you have a psychiatrist 24-7? Um, what is your staff to patient ratio? So those are kind of like the easiest measures to do. Um, then there's process measures, and that's kind of what do you do. So for example, like door to balloon time for acute MI, they measure that in ERs all the time. The reason they measure it is because there's evidence that shows the faster you do it, the better outcome is, but it's easier to measure that process thing. And then there's outcome measures, and that is what you're doing working. Those are the hardest things to measure and then both tie to something that you're doing, um, but that is kind of that's what we all aspire to have is good outcome measures. So things like mortality, patient satisfaction, um, you know, readmissions, and things like that. So next slide. Um, then when you actually go to try to create these measures, these structures, process, outcome measures, there's all these different frameworks for how do you do that. You know, some of them like here are the nine factors you should take into account. And I'm, I'm simple, so I like three. And this comes from a paper that was in Psych Services a while ago. I really like this guy's model. Um, where he's like, really, it's pretty simple. It needs to be meaningful. So is what you're measuring, does it reflect something that's clinically important? And is there evidence to support measuring this? A lot of times for crisis, there's not a lot of evidence in terms of validating these things. So 
we, we go a lot on face validity or borrowing from other fields that have, have done similar measures. Is it feasible to collect? Because you don't want to have a bunch of staff that just sits there and does nothing but audit charts. That's kind of a waste of time. So you want to have a way that you could actually collect the data and collect accurate data without creating a bunch of extra work for yourself. And then is it actionable? So is it something that if you collect some measure and you're not doing well on it, is it actually within your power to fix it? So like for example, a lot of times like health plans are held towards people who need crisis services have to get an appointment within seven days. And that makes sense for the state to hold the health plan, like Medicaid to that, but it doesn't make sense to hold the crisis center for that by themselves because I can drive the person there to the clinic and then they can get to the clinic and the clinic can say, oh, we're short staffed today. We don't have a doctor today. They can't be seen. Like, I can't fix that. Um, so, you know, it makes sense to measure maybe some process metrics that ensure that the crisis center is doing all these things to try to make sure the person is doing care coordination and gets to the clinic um, and hold the health plan accountable to make sure the two parts play together or maybe have some kind of metric where they share in the risk, but it has to be something that I can actually do something to fix it. And that's what we argue with our health plans when they give us metrics about that. <laughs> so these are the actual measures that we came out with. Um, and we published this, and I think there's the paper, there's a link to the paper on the slide, and I think it's on your, your website. Um, and we've been refining this ever since. So um, under for Timely, what we did was we basically borrowed from emergency medicine because emergency medicine is very good at, at measuring throughput. So door to doctor time. Um, that's a, and we made it door to diagnostic evaluation with the eye towards maybe this could be used for more than just our model where whoever it is that's your highest level, your licensed person who's doing kind of the highest level evaluation, what's the time to get in front of that person? Um, left without being seen or people getting fed up and just like leaving because the wait time is so long and then maybe high risk people are wandering off and you don't know what's going to happen to them. Um, the time, the dwell times are the next one. So the time from when the person got to your facility to when they were discharged. And again, this is what we were doing this for our 23 hour ops model. So, um, you know, these for some of the crisis res things that y'all are doing may not be completely, completely applicable, but, um, but basically getting people what they need quickly. And then for us, because we um, send a lot of people to inpatient care after, I mean, we drop, we divert most to outpatient care, but for the ones that we send to inpatient care, how long does it take to get them to that hospital? Um, so we, we measure that. Then for safety measures, if you're taking care of people who are a danger to self or danger to others, then we should ensure that they don't do anything to hurt themselves or hurt their, hurt their, or anybody else. So we, um, but we would find that there's a lot, like in our Medicaid um, compliance stuff, it would say like we need to report quote serious suicide attempts. It's like, well, what does that even mean? So we took the CDC has criteria on how to nomenclature for self-directed violence. So we took those criteria and then they, they categorize it where it's mild, moderate, or severe injury. And so we measure with moderate or severe. Because, like, so say someone is, they kind of scratch their wrist, and then we jump in and stop them, and there's, like, a little tiny superficial cut. Well, we did the right thing. Like, it, the system worked. But if they were to able act to have a more serious injury, then we failed. So we measure that for self-directed violence, and then we applied those towards patients committing violence against other patients. And so we measure those as well. And then we measure um, workplace violence with injury. So we use the OSHA criteria for that. The accessible measures we've struggled with. And so we um, we put these in kind of as provisional, but we were looking at, because like Steve was saying, in psych, we have a reputation for having a list of exclusionary criteria 10 miles long. So we wanted to say, well, okay, how often are we denying? And we tried to measure that, but then we figured out that Everybody knows who denies and who doesn't, and so it's like a self-selecting population, so we haven't been doing that one. Um, we've experimented with some stuff on trying to gauge how accessible we are in terms of people answering the phone and things like that, but we're still struggling with that one. Um, least restrictive, so we've got the typical ones that we talk about in terms of seclusion and restraint, and we just use the Joint Commission's met, uh, methodology for that. But also, um, similar to what Steve was saying, is like these, a lot of these folks do not need to be in the hospital, and so, we also look at least restrictive care in terms of their disposition. So we look at the 
the, the people who hit our 23-hour OBS unit meet medical necessity criteria for inpatient. Because if they were in an ED and your only choice is a bed versus home and you're an ED and have no psych expertise, then they're going to go to an inpatient bed. And so we take those folks and we discharge about 65, 70 percent. And, um, and that's kind of, you know, so that's one of our goals is to try to get people to the community as much as possible. We also look at the conversion of voluntary status, um, which is a little bit separate because we have people who come into us involuntary, and a lot of those folks can go home, but some of them still need the hospital, but we're able to engage with them and they accept voluntary treatment, and we drop the involuntary component of it. Um, for effectiveness, um, so we look at readmissions, and in the ER world, the term terminology that's used is unscheduled return visits. Because you know, in, in the ER, they may say, come back and get your stitches taken out. You don't want to count that against yourself. Um, and then we split them between what happens on the second visit. So if someone comes to our 23-hour OBS unit, then they, we discharge them, and then they come back within 72 hours. We can either send them back out again, or we can admit them to an inpatient facility. And so we split them out because there's a, some suggestion in the literature, on the ED literature, that maybe those populations are different, that maybe the ones who keep going back out outpatient, they're having some failure in the outpatient system, but maybe the ones who you admitted when they came back, maybe that was could be more likely to have been an error decision-making the first time around. So we split them out. We haven't really found that that's the case, but we split them out just to see. Um, and then consumer and family centers, so that's our consumer satisfaction. And, you know, there's no course, the common theme in crisis is there's no standard way to do this, and everyone's got their own homegrown surveys. But what hospitals tend to do is when they're comparing surveys across hospitals, they have one common item that says, are you likely to recommend this place to your friend or family? And so we pull that one, even though our surveys are slightly different in our two facilities, we pull that one out and, and compare that way. And then we look at, did we attempt to involve the family? I mean, a lot of patients don't want their family involved, but we document that we at least attempted to involve their family. And then our partnership me measures, um, you know, like Steve was saying, do you want to get people out of jail instead of, you know, getting treatment? And so if that's the case, then we need to be easier to access than the ER, and we need to be easier to access than the jail for the cops. So we consider the cops as an important customer of ours as our patients are. Um, that's where half of it, more than half of our volume comes from. So we measure the police turnaround time. So for Adults, our target, the median is 10 minutes. For kids, it's 20 minutes is our target. And we usually, usually it's about seven minutes on the adults. Um, we, and if we hear that officers are being, you know, delayed, then we hear about it and then we try to, you know, try to fix that. Um, we measure that time that we're on diversion, meaning that we're full and we can't take people from outside ERs because part of what we're here to do is to service those ERs to get the patients out. Um, we've been, Measuring in our Phoenix facility, the time it takes from the ER says, I have somebody to send to you, to how long it takes for them to get to us. Um, and then we look at, are we being a good partner in terms of sending the paperwork, <clears throat> discharge summaries and care coordination documents to the receiving outpatient clinic? Um, and then we started, we do that quite regularly for the psych info, and then we'll do more of an effort to send um, documents to our primary care um, partners as well. Okay. So those are kind of the metrics that we've created. And over the last couple of years, we've developed scorecards at both of our facilities. We're able to compare across each other. Um, the Joint Commission, since we published this, they've approached us, and they are actually have a project that's going to start sometime this year to develop core measures for crisis for behavioral health crisis services, like they do for ER and inpatient psych. Wow. And so there's um, so I'm going to be working with them on that whenever that starts. But um, that's kind of the approach that we've taken. You know, when we know that right now this is only validated for two crisis centers in Arizona, and our our goal is to try to study this and try to come up with um, you know common measures that the, that the field can agree on. And just one more point thing is. As far as um, pay for performance is a big deal in healthcare these days, and in Arizona they're requiring an increasing percentage of the Medicaid contracts every year to actually be tied to pay for performance. I think it's supposed to be up to 50% um, within a couple of years. So in Phoenix we actually had 
um, twenty percent of our contract was to pay for performance measures, and we were able because we had done this, we were able to say to them, "Here is actually some academic rigor towards measure development, and the ones that you're proposing, not so not so good. Why don't you do this one?" And so we were successful. We hit all four of our, our measures because we were able to help choose good ones and the ones that were actually you know, feasible. Well, Margie, this has been incredible. I think that you are, I, I think that uh, you've blown many of our minds um, and in a good way too, uh, because this has just given us such a, a new and fresh perspective to look at how we measure things within our homes. Um, I want to give just maybe about two minutes if anyone has any questions that they want to uh, pose for Margie. Um, I, I agree. Very, very interesting uh, presentation, Margie. Uh, we also have a crisis, what's called a crisis stabilization unit under the Medicaid process in California that is adjoined to one of our crisis residential programs in San Francisco. And um, it, it, uh, because it's embedded in the public system, it has a much more rudimentary basic set of performance metrics. The police say if we take people, <laughs> the, the you know, if we divert and, and move people down line. So this is all very interesting. I just wanted to clarify one thing. You know, Medicaid does pay for crisis residential treatment. If Medicaid does, Medicare does not. Right, Medicare, Medicare does it. Have, yeah. And so that's why you got 50 different ways to do it. Right. And... Uh, and uh, I want California as a part of paying for crisis residential, and I think other jurisdictions have various uh, state-based sets of uh, regulations and descriptions of quality of care. So those are available for those crisis residential treatment that are funded through Medicaid. But okay, great. Um, we ha we got to move on, but uh, Margie, if it's okay, I'll I'll. Uh, pass along your contact information in case any of our uh, providers have any questions for you. Sure. Awesome. Thank you again so much. Um, so now we're going to move along into our uh, into our data, into our nitty gritty uh, survey results. Um, so we're going to start with our our area of consume of excuse me of customer satisfaction. So. One of the first questions that we asked in our survey was, how do you measure customer satisfaction in your home? And the vast majority of people said that it's through a written survey. Um, and just, re just remember that almost all of the questions that we ask uh, can allow more than one answer. So if you're thinking like, why don't these things uh, add up to 100%, it's like 140. Well, it's not, it's not mental health math, that's just um, us uh, asking, giving people multiple options in their responses. So but far and away, the, the written survey is the most frequent uh, use uh, or, or form of uh, measuring customer satisfaction. If we look at how it's collected, um, it's almost 70% of the homes reported uh, collecting it in a structured setting, like a scaling question, like your scale, using yes, no questions. Um, the, some of the scales also have a, a narrative to say like, you know, what specifically did you like about the program? What did you not like? Um, and then on, on down the line, uh, a few of the comments that came in in this section were using uh, online surveys as an option. Uh, so something like SurveyMonkey where people who are discharging could have a link uh, to the survey. Let's say they didn't have time, their, their ride was coming and they, they had to leave. Um, that they could still go back and fill out the survey. I imagine the advantage here is it puts all of the information into one place where you can analyze it really easily. Um, another organization mentioned using iPads or kiosks in the near future as collection methods. So not being limited to an office where the computer is or to where the, to, to where the technology sits in your home, but being able to be mobile and maybe meet a person in their room to do their discharge uh, paperwork or, or, uh, or satisfaction. And then somebody, another home mentioned using the same survey at discharge and at the 30-day follow-up. I thought that was kind of cool because then you, if you're asking maybe even some of the same questions at intake, you could have three different data points at which you're measuring how a person is doing. So when we talk more about customer satisfaction and, and what is done with the information, uh, most people say that the, the results are discussed with the program leadership or executive leadership to improve services or to review the survey results in staff meetings. Um, 
uh, one of the homes mentioned that they use the data from this not just for those reasons, but also to support uh, the, the CARF accreditation guidelines that they're held to. Um, and then another program mentioned a number of uses for the data, including seeking funding sources, financial supports, and enhancing collaborations. <clears throat> The next section is about outcome measures. So just asking if there's any outcome measures that the homes maintain. Uh, most mentioned uh, recidivism, uh, followed by the pre and post test measures of a PHQ-9, a PHQ-2, a GAD-7, uh, etc. Uh, a few of the other tools that were mentioned in the responses were the MISHIP, MISIP the CSSRS, the Columbia uh, Suicide Risk Assessment, the Magellan CHI, the Colorado Client Assessment Record, and the CAGE scores. And as we're talking here, if, if, if there's any comments or questions that you want to throw out, please feel free to do that uh, while we're going along. Um, and uh, and I'll, I'll try to address them and make sure we get out of here uh, off our call on time as well. Uh, the next question is about uh, maintaining process measures. Um, so satisfaction, and, and when we say this, we mean not the results of the satisfaction survey, but the implementation of the satisfaction survey. So do you measure what percentage of people were given a satisfaction survey or what percentage were, uh, you know, completed their treatment planning? Um, and one of the, so you can see those numbers there. One of the feedback pieces that we got was that uh, one home barely has enough time to provide services to clients, much less to spend time in measurements. And so, you know, resource allocation can be a big barrier, and we'll talk about those barriers um, here in just a minute. The next area has to do with uh, collecting data for those metrics, for the, the outcome results, and most homes do. Most homes are collecting length of stay, hospitalization, elopement. If I've talked to you on the phone, usually that's a question that I've asked about your home is, do you know what your length of stay is? And, and everyone usually does. Um, and there was a few uh, additional comments there just about using an EHS or an EHR to um, split up length of stay and, and put it into other data areas. So this graph is the only one that's not based on percentages and it's just based on total number of people that responded. So uh, the top blue area has to do with the, the data that you collect being structured. Um, then the next area is, is unstructured data and then manual and then not collected. So the follow-up appointments and elopement look to be the areas where no data is collected the most frequently. The length of stay is collected mostly in a structured data set. So when we talk about the challenges to collecting metrics, um, the biggest challenges that were identified were not enough time to devote to measures, and then a lack of necessary technology. Um, one of the homes, the last comment on the, on the side there says that um, it's just too difficult to do as a manual process. And we've heard that here in Michigan with some of the, the quality or performance measures we're expected to keep. Uh, it's, a, it's a manual process that's been manual since it started. Obviously the technology exists for people to collect these things, but it's not uh, it, maybe it hasn't been made a priority to purchase those things or to hire the right people. Somebody else mentioned awaiting a, a health information exchange implementation so that you can know what a person is doing after they leave your home. And I think that's a limitation. You know, very few of our providers that are participating control a large part of the continuum of services. And so when someone leaves, you're not necessarily incentivized unless your payment is based off of it, but you're not necessarily incentivized to do a lot of follow-up with those people because it's not like that bed stays empty, right? Like most people, uh, uh, most homes have somebody in that bed by that evening and then you're left to, to address those issues, which, which is probably the appropriate, uh, <laughs> the appropriate level of prioritization. Um, so I wanted to turn it over to Miranda Green at uh, Pivot Crisis Home in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, who is going to touch a little bit on the, the crisis spotlight in Michigan. Thanks, Travis. <clears throat> so, um, in Michigan right now, with much thanks to Travis, we are, we've been initiating some statewide metrics um, and collecting monthly data for those. 
for those metrics. So it really started out um, as a group of workers from different crisis homes throughout the state having conversations about what kind of data we thought would be meaningful um, as well as feasible for all the involved programs to collect. And we knew it would be vital that the data was collected regularly and that everyone was really on the same page with what we meant by um, the different metrics, how we would be collecting them and when they needed to be um, submitted um, so that we can make the meaning of them in order for, like I said, the data to have some meaning. So <clears throat> sometimes that meant for some of the homes to have um, some working meetings and some conversations with their IT team to develop um, more efficient ways to collect the data, like we were just saying, um, so that people aren't having to do it manually because then it's really not sustainable. And then um, I think to me the most important part of this initiative was to make sure that we were reporting out the metrics um, and what we had collected to our team. So at my program here at Pivot, um, we have monthly um, clinical team meetings and we were really talking about what we've been collecting and um, making sense of what that information means and how it can improve our service delivery. Cool, thank you very much, Miranda. And so uh, we took, just to, to follow up with what Miranda said, we took a few of those um, areas and um, and submitted it to National Council to uh, to say we think this would be interesting and some other states might benefit from it. And we were selected to do a poster session. So we don't know the date and time of that yet, but we will be doing that um, in April at the National Council Conference in Seattle. Um, so look, if you're there, uh, look for us and we'll have a, a cool interactive screen with our uh, our virtual poster going there. And uh, we're excited to, to kind of show us some more details about that at that uh, at that conference. So jumping back into uh, the last uh, area, which is employee satisfaction. Uh, we kind of asked these questions the same way that we did with the consumer satisfaction or customer satisfaction. Um, and formal surveys and verbal communication are the biggest ways that people measure uh, employee satisfaction. And when we think about what you do with that data, um, again, it's discussed with program and executive leadership or it's reviewed in staff meetings. And that can be a really precarious place to be as a manager or as a director when you are reviewing unfavorable um, uh, satisfaction surveys. You know, some employers will just go to, go to lengths to avoid having that conversation because it's just uncomfortable to say, hey, we're not doing as good as we could or the people that work here aren't that happy. Um, but it can all, but what, people who make that decision to share that uncomfortable data, I think, can um, can also show a step towards vulnerability to try and, and make some of those improvements. So we just talked about a lot of things in a very short period of time. Um, I wanted to open it up for just two or three minutes, maybe, if people have any observations or any questions about what we collected and what we talked about today. And no questions is okay too. Um, so just going through the last uh, few pieces, um, for those of you that are new to the call, this is your first time, uh, we, this is kind of the, the ways that we have people engaged, which is meeting participation, content submission, uh, review of the content, and uh, then state, some state policy research, which we'll probably get into in a few more months as we start to, to really uh, distinguish between um, uh, the, the policies that govern the, the crisis home operations. Wanted to let you know if anyone is planning to go to National Council, we are coordinating a, a crisis uh, residential group meetup. Uh, that's going to be on the second day of the conference, which is Tuesday, April 4th, uh, probably around 4.30. And we will, uh, we're, we're still trying to determine the lo location of that, but if you're interested in joining us, uh, send me an email and I'll make sure that uh, you get included in that communication. Uh, lastly, for March, uh, there's two areas that we will probably focus on. One is the community relations side of running a crisis home. So your marketing, your public relations, how you manage relationships with your providers and your partners and maybe even your neighbors. Um, and then a question that was brought up by one of our um, uh, crisis homes in 
Colorado, I think Jamie Webster, uh, who brought this up after our last call, which is, you know, it might be helpful to understand a little bit more about the taxonomy or the, the classifications of our crisis homes. And Steve did a nice job of touching on this uh, in, in, during his time of our call today to say, um, you know, how are we different? How can we understand each other a little bit more? And what are some of the reasons for those nuances or for those differences? So I think that we're going to tackle that as well. I think it'll give us a, a better appreciation of one another's services too. And uh, so we'll, we'll poll or we'll, we'll survey on those two items and then we'll spend some more time talking about that and trying to see if we can come up with maybe a classification system and, and maybe there's homes that function in more than one way. I know that our, our Texas constituents of which we've um, added several in the last few months, uh, there's three different classifications for uh, what might be one classification in a different state when you talk about crisis residential or crisis stabilization services. So um, we will, you know, we'll go there and uh, kind of get in that uh, space that might feel, I don't know, maybe a little, um, maybe like the water isn't completely clear, I guess, but uh, we'll, we'll try to clear it up a little bit. We'll put some iodine in it uh, for our next call. So our next call is scheduled for Wednesday, March 15th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, if you have questions that you want to address with the group, you can email crisisresidentialnetwork at tbdsolutions.com. Uh, the meeting slides from today and from all our meetings are on our website at crisisresidentialnetwork.com. If you click the best practices work group link, that will take you there. Um, and we are now recording our meetings so people who can't make them can still participate. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Uh, if not, thanks everyone for participating. Thank you to Steve and to Margie for uh, your input on the call, and we'll look forward to talking next month. Mm -hmm.